Welcome to the Solidarity Vigil to stand with the Sikh community. Thousands of you are joining us tonight from across the United States and around the world. Our vigil tonight will be held in English, but also available in Punjabi and in Spanish. Click on the interpretation option at the bottom of your screen and select language of choice. Closed captioning is also available by hitting the CC button on the bottom of your screen as well. My name is Valerie Kaur, and I am so grateful you are here tonight. We are gathering tonight one week after the massacre in Indianapolis. We are gathering in grief and rage with love and solidarity for the Sikh community we are also holding space for the collective pain we are all holding in our bodies this week. In the wake of the verdict over George Floyd's murder, news of more police killings, in the face of anti-Black racism and ongoing racial violence against Asian, Latinx, and Indigenous peoples, no one person, no one community can bear this much trauma alone. That is why we are gathering now, to breathe together, to commit to one another, to deepen the ties that bind us, to embody our love and solidarity, to turn this virtual space into a sacred space. So I invite you now to place your feet on the earth, and imagine all the other people, the thousands of people who are watching right now with their bodies on this same sweet earth. And together, take one deep breath. Let it come. Good. And let it go. Before I tell you about tonight's program, I need to share with you what we know about the massacre in Indianapolis. One week ago tonight, a 19-year-old gunman opened fire at a FedEx facility where he had worked, and he knew this facility was primarily staffed by sick employees. He killed eight people. We mourn all of them. Four of them were sick. We are hearing eyewitness reports that the gunman specifically targeted, hunted, us during the rampage. We also know that the gunman had visited white supremacist sites, but we have yet to hear whether the police will investigate bias as a motive, and the media has been relatively quiet. But here is what I want you to know. Whether or not this massacre is ever classified as a hate crime, the impact on the Sikh community is nearly identical. 
for six, not just in Indianapolis, but across America. This shooting has opened the wound of all the racial violence we have survived going back to 9-11 and long before. In the last week, sick advocates have been in nonstop crisis response. Our Gurdwara's increasing security, our families in grief and trauma, our Vaisakhi celebrations turned into memorials, parents like me holding our children close. Yet there are few headlines. There are no hashtags, no visible solidarity. We are changing that tonight. You are changing that tonight by being here. Tonight will be a night of testimony, music, prayer, and song. We are dividing the program tonight into three parts. In part one, we will hear from sick community voices, including family members from, Oak, from Indianapolis. In part two, we will hear from faith leaders of all traditions. In part three, we will hear from movement leaders from Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian communities. You will also hear representatives from the White House and the Human Rights Commission. Woven throughout the program, you will hear sick artists, poets, musicians, and sick youth, as well as other artists joining us in solidarity. We will be holding our space tonight for two hours. Listen, rest, return, keep listening. Remember, you don't have to know people in order to grieve with them. You grieve with them in order to know them. So we invite you to come to know us tonight. And I invite you to focus on a word that you will hear again and again, the word jardikala. You see, six are not just victims. We have wisdom to offer America about longevity and resilience in the face of oppression. Our gathering tonight is in the sick spirit of jardikala, ever rising spirits, even in darkness ever rising joy, even in the labors for justice, as if to say, they can colonize us, they can terrorize us, they can massacre us, but they cannot crush us. We are sovereign. To my six sisters and brothers, aunties and uncles, our children, you are not alone. We are not alone. We can return to Chardikala together when we are in community. And tonight we have people from all different backgrounds who are inside this pain with us. And from this pain, we will find a way to rise as we always have. You can follow the program tonight at solidarityvigil.com. There, you can also leave a message or a prayer to the families of Indianapolis. We will deliver those prayers in person and handbound books. You can also donate to the families on that site. And we invite you tonight, if you're someone who uses social media, to post about what you are hearing and what you are seeing with the hashtag StandWithSix. If you need ideas for your posts, you can find them also at that same website solidarityvigil.com. I'm going to introduce you now to my dear friend and brother, Reverend Michael Bray Matthews of the organization called Faith in Action. He is hosting the vigil with me tonight alongside my organization, the Revolutionary Love Project and 120 partners, partner organizations all across the United States. Before I turn it over to him, I want to invite us to take a moment of silence as we lift our gaze and hold in our hearts the people we lost in Indianapolis one week ago. I invite you to close your eyes or place your hand on your heart with me as you hear their names. Amarjit Kaur Johal. Amarjit Kaur Seko. Just Vinder Kaur. Just Vinder Singh. 
John Weisart, Carly Smith, Matthew Alexander, Samaria Blackwell, Ashe. And we continue to hold all the names. Greetings, beloved community. On behalf of Faith in Action, I wish to thank my dear sister Valerie Kaur and the Revolutionary Love Project for the invitation to conspire, collaborate, and co create for racial justice, multi faith solidarity and communal healing tonight. If there was ever a time to practice radical, inclusive solidarity, it is right now. This week, we could barely take in the news of accountability in the case of the murder of George Floyd before we were bombarded with repeated reminders of the genuine crisis we face as a society a crisis we face when it comes to the disregard for Black life. While we celebrated with the Floyd family, we must also learn to hold space for the family of Dante Wright. And we must now bear the family and friends of Micaiah Bryant of Columbus, Ohio in our hearts. As the father of a young Black man who lives in Columbus, my grief, my fear, and my rage are palpable. And so it means everything to me to gather with a community that will hold both the particular and the universal. I am here to stand in solidarity with my sick family. I am here to bring visibility to my Asian kindred because I know as a product of the Black church tradition that our well being, our flourishing, and indeed our liberation are tied together. Those of us who have targets on our backs, those of us who know the experience of racial trauma and violence must stand both in our particularities as well as our shared destiny. Zen master Larry Ward says that our racial suffering is deep and wide. It is a particular kind of samsara, repeated cycles of bitterness, pain, and fear. Tonight, we gather to generate new cycles. In the face of the vicious cycle of racial and religious oppression, we are stirring a new revolution, a revolution of what Valerie calls sweet labor. You see, we are here in love, revolutionary love, to breathe and push together until we birth beloved community. Thank you, brother. We invite Ali Young, Danae citizen and storyteller to open us with an indigenous blessing followed by a song from the Sikh tradition, inspired by the Sikh tradition, by singer, songwriter, activist, Sunny Singh. Ali. Yad e, Ali Young Rinche, Totoni Nishle, Tona Bashishchin, Nakaidin Adashiche, Nat Odin Etachini Dashinele. Thank you for having me tonight. I am very, um proud to to be here and to um stand in solidarity 
um, with my good friend Valerie and the sick community. Um, I just want to start off with a few words and uh, first and foremost, uh, land acknowledgement, um, because I think that in order to heal as a people, we need to acknowledge the history that we um, have endured, especially as uh, communities of color. And this country is founded on genocide and slavery. And uh, a, a land acknowledgement, um, you know, it, it calls, uh, it acknowledges that history uh, that is needed for us to heal. And uh, so I am on the land, I'm zooming in from the land of my tribe, the Diné people, um, known as the Navajo Nation. Uh, and in Indianapolis uh, is the ancestral homelands of the Kickapoo tribe. And so we remember our ancestors um, who once lived in, in these parts of the country, um, in, in these lands, the first peoples, and um, the, the populations that have been decimated over the, the centuries. Uh, and next, I, I just want to offer a prayer, um, and I'll start off in my language, uh, my Diné language. Um, and that that is our a prayer of um, connecting to Mother Earth, and we always begin our prayers by acknowledging Mother Earth and Father Sky, and we are the human beings who are in between. And um, we, we pay tribute to Mother Earth because of, um, to appreciate the interconnectedness of life and the beauty way, which is the, um, the life that we live as Dine people. Living in the beauty way is acknowledging um, that we are connected, that we are all related and that we must treat each other that way. And um, as, you know, the way that we're related to Mother Earth and that though we go through, um, you know, trauma and negativity, that as long as we live in balance, in a harmonious balance, that we'll always return to light in that beauty. Uh, and I just wanna lastly offer some, um, a little bit of uh, my culture to everyone around the symbolism of rainbows and which is very much what I see happening this evening with all of us coming together in solidarity. Uh, the rainbow is significant in my culture. It's in our sand paintings, it's in our Navajo Nation flag and that represents this path of the beauty way and how uh, we are stronger together when all of our colors come together. That is when healing happens. And I'm just, again, thankful for Valerie um, calling on me to open this up, to help open this up. And I hope that my words offered um, some healing and perspective. If you have. Oh, 
चढ़ी कला पीछे दे चढ़ी कला पीछे दे बोले सोने हाल सहस्री अकाल बोले सोने हाल सहस्री अकाल हो नानक नाम चढ़ी कला तेरे भाने सब खालसा वाहेगुरु जी की फतेह नानक नाम चढ़दी कला तेरे पाने सरबत दा अपना ओ नानक बाय द नाम एवर राइजिंग स्पिरिट्स चढ़दी कला एंड बाय योर विल मे ऑल ह्यूमैनिटी बी अपलिफ्टेड it's such a powerful message and it's one that six bring forward daily seeing divinity in all people is our charge and seeing vaiguru in all situations is our way but it's hard we feel this today in so many moments how do we wish well to all of humanity when some of our fellow human beings are trying to harm us how do we find happiness when we are terrorized where does resilience come from i was just putting my girls to bed and as six have done nightly for centuries we sang sohila and one line stuck with me तुम गावो मेरे निरपो का सोहेला हो वारी जित सोहेले सदा सुख होए रहो सिंग द सॉन्ग ऑफ माय फियरलेस वन आई सैक्रिफाइस माय सेल्फ टू दैट सॉन्ग दैट इज इटर्नल जॉय फियरलेसनेस इन द फेस ऑफ हेट जॉय इन द फेस ऑफ टेरर how do we find light in darkness we refuse to give in to fear nirpo and we double down on love this sounds beautiful but it's not easy we know that and yet we also know that living with fearless love is possible because our gurus have taught us how because they modeled this for us and because our community has learned how to live life in this way we also know it's possible because we see the sick community in indianapolis 
living with fearless love before our very eyes. And there's perhaps nothing that I admire more than seeing people respond to tragedy with grace and resilience and with jardikala. And that's why it's my honor to introduce Gomal Gaur Johan, granddaughter of Bibi Amarjit Gaur Joho, who we lost in the shooting in Indianapolis. Gomal will be sharing with us a reflection from the ground that she prepared for us with members of her family and members of the Indianapolis Sikh community. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Um, I would just like to start off by thanking everybody who has held vigils in honor of the victims. God bless each and every one of you. We feel all the love. We feel your guys' energy and you guys are really helping us, um, you know, just function at this point. Amarji Joel was a mother to everybody. Since the tragedy, individuals have reached out endlessly and expressed the same opinion. She never let anybody feel like less than family. Mrs. Joel was more than that to us. She was the glue that held everybody together. So many of her plans were cut short and it's not fair. On Friday, she was looking forward to her granddaughter's birthday. Soon she was flying to her grandson's graduation in California and many more plans that she was looking forward to. Her younger son had moved here to Indiana just for her. Mrs. Joel was looking forward to her younger son having kids so she could help raise them. A mother's biggest joy is watching her family grow and being there every step of the way. But those opportunities have now been taken away from her forever. Mrs. Joel had begun working at FedEx due to open leisure time, just like many others. Culturally, many were comfortable working there because there was never a fear of language barriers. They were surrounded mostly by people from similar cultural backgrounds. As an immigrant, that seems like a rare condition to feel comfortable anywhere other than home. Workers shared traditional food, spoke our common tongue, and Mrs. Joel even stated that she enjoyed going to work because she could enjoy the laughter and giggles with her peers. She was a dedicated, reliable, and hardworking employee. Her hard work and dedication to work was recognized by everybody. The day of the tragedy, Mrs. Joel was doing what she always did, being selfless. She grabbed her check and then was about to head out to start her car so it could warm up because our family members carpooled to work with her. We were told she was found with her check in her hand. On Friday, the family was scrambling around town to gain any new information. Hospitals and police stations kept giving everybody the runaround. They avoided giving us any information and still continue to do so. Everybody is processing their grief, sadness, and numbness differently. I personally felt helpless that I couldn't help take away any pain from family members after this tragic loss. That is when I started contacting whomever, whomever I could to mobilize and provide as much support as possible. Witnesses are all giving various views of this tragic incident that took place. The main conclusion that we can draw at this point is that the community is shaken up and scared. Many individuals have called stating that they can't eat, sleep, and are experiencing survivor's guilt. It pains me to hear that our elderly are saying that they wish that they had died instead. They wish that they could take away everyone's pain that had lost someone in this traumatic incident. Indiana has a prominent sick community. We have been involved in community outreach and support. Unfortunately, some individuals still do not feel comfortable. I know people, including myself, who have been told you should go back to your country. And they have felt so help helpless living in a place where they not only have a lack of knowledge of resources available, but also a lack of acceptance from this country where they moved to so they can provide for their family and to live the American dream. After this incident, many feel unsafe leaving their homes 
or the proximity of their loved ones. We need to do better on that front to help build a system for rapid response in each of our communities. Regarding this particular tragedy, we want all liable parties to be held accountable, including FedEx, the law enforcement, the NRA, the state, and the federal government itself. They didn't have a problem hiring Punjabi people because we are reliable and dedicated to our duties. Unfortunately, they have not done the best to their ability to service all communities, including minority groups. This includes minorities in race, color, ethnicity, culture, and economic status. We want to know why mental health advocates aren't being provided that have cultural competence. And if you are now, why did it take a tragedy of this magnitude for that to occur? Why weren't the security cameras turned on? If they were on, why weren't they being monitored? If the gunman was able to make it from the east side of the building to the front, the alarms could have sounded a lot before this occurring. It appears that their security system was more focused on protecting their replaceable merchandise than it was on protecting the irreplaceable lives that worked there. Due to their lack of effort, many families lost their loved ones and many people will never be the same. All due to an incident that could have been easily prevented. The Joel family wants everybody to respect our privacy at this time so we can lay our caring and mother, caring and loving mother to rest, but never to stop saying and remembering her name. Amrindi Joel, a loving mother, a grandmother, and a sister deserves her justice, and all of us need to come together and stand up against a broken system. We have moved past thinking and asking for justice. We now need to go out and take it. It is our right and we want our rights starting now. Thank you so much. Gomo, sister, we see you. We are inside the grief with you. We are inside the rage with you. This is your grandmother and yet inside of your own grief and trauma, here you are finding language and issuing calls to action and organizing. And what I want you to know, my love, is that you are not alone. We will not leave your side. Here tonight are people who know what it takes to stay, to stay in it, not just in the days after a tragedy like this, but in the weeks and the months and the years to come. The last time sick Americans were massacred on this scale was in Oak Creek, Wisconsin in 2012, when a white supremacist opened fire in a sick Gurdwara on a Sunday morning, killing seven people. We have here tonight Bardeep Singh Kaleka, who was the son of Satwant Singh Kaleka, who was killed on that day. Bardeep, we are so grateful you are here today to share in this pain and also tell us your story. Thank you so much, Val, and thank you, Komal. Um, I want to center everyone in um, Indianapolis and everything that's happening with the families. Um, what, as you were sharing, all of those start, those reminders came back, the survivor's guilt, the survivor's relief, the investigation, the, the lack of transparency, all of that. And understand that we, you are not alone and that you have family out there. Um, so just, just please uh, make sure that we keep reaching out, we keep organizing, we keep moving forward with that same spirit of Chaldi Kala that we are all speaking about tonight. I was recalling a story about my father and uh, my father was, was a farmer um, from a rural village in Punjab. My mother was also a farmer. And I recall one of the fondest memories that I have about him is how deep he used to dig his hands into the soil. Um, I would oftentimes see him working on my landscaping beds at my house, kind of, uh, ridiculing me on how lazy I was being and not taking care of those weeds that were growing. My father came here with my mother, myself, and my brother when I was six years old, 1982. He wanted to create a better life for our family, as do many immigrants, as, many, as do many sick Americans. He, uh, over time, built a, 
a temple, a Gudwara on the south side of Milwaukee. The congregation started off small and now it numbers into the thousands. August 3rd was the last time that I saw my father alive. That was my birthday. And by that time, I knew that he achieved what he wanted to achieve, not knowing that the next time I would see him, as Val said, a white supremacist took the lives of seven sick Americans who were working on their American dream, only to have it cut short by people saying that they're, they're, they're not deserving of it. All of the people that were working at that FedEx that day were working on their American dream. All of us are working on creating a better America. Today, you are all survivors. This survivor family is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. You are all survivors because you are all witnesses. You are witnessing all of this harm that is being caused. And as most have said, if, we, if this is a land that is formed from genocide, colonization, slavery, then we must all become like our ancestors, like my father, and all become farmers. And we need to dig our hands so deep in this soil that we change the bedrock and the foundation of this country going forward for our children. May God bless your commitment to till the soil, to replant. And as we've all said, Nam Chardikala Terebane Sarbatapula. May we be relentlessly optimistic for the peace and prosperity of all mankind. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. We have next Rana Sodi. Rana Sodi's brother, Balbir Singh Sodi, was the first person killed in a hate crime in the aftermath of September 11th. And so you're seeing the connection we're drawing here. You see, Indianapolis didn't just happen in a vacuum. It's happened in the context of 20 years of racial violence against our community, going back long before. We've lived here for more than a century, and we have always been at the forefront of hate violence Our people wear articles of faith, many of us, wear long hair that we wrap in turbans as a sign of our commitment to Chardikala, to love and service, to love without limit. How ironic that it's these very articles of faith, these turbans, these brown skin, these beards, these, that have marked us as terrorists in this country. When Bilbir uncle was killed, he was the first of countless people who have been killed, beaten, stabbed, bullied, harassed, denied in the last 20 years. Some studies say that sick Americans are five times more likely to be targets of hate than we were before 9-11. You see, it, the backlash never ended for us, did it? 20 years later, here we are mourning with the families in Indianapolis against this backdrop of ongoing trauma. But Rana Ji knows what it takes to stay in Chardikala, not just in the weeks after, but in the years after losing a loved one. Rana Ji, would you share with us now Balbir Singh Sodi's story and how that day has changed your life and any words you have to offer us now? I invite you to come now. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, I'm here today to feeling the grief and I feel the pain all over again after 20 years later. And, and I go with the hope and, uh, and I, I think we all can change this thing. One day we, we will have a better world without hate. I want to uh, share my brother's story Balbir Singh Sodi was a first hate crime victim after 9-11. He was killed on September 15 while he was working in his gas station 
and planting a flower in front of his gas station. The person, the murderer, my brother, shot him from the back five times and killed him. And my brother, and he's a, like to my father, and he's a eldest in, in the USA too, while we was living five brother together in the USA, he's the eldest one. And he keep our family together. And in fact, three days before his death, he cooked me a dinner and invited me to come and join me to with his dinner. And since last 20 year, I don't think uh, my single day go without when I don't remember him. And the person who killed my brother and after that he was arrested and he showed that I am a patriot and he want to kill all the towel heads and their children too. And that's he saying to the Sikhs as a towel head. And after 10 months later, I lost my another brother in San Francisco while he was driving a cab. That mystery didn't solve until today. We don't know it is hate crime or what, but I lost my two brother in 10 months after 9-11. And that's the first time I knew about America, how much people have a ignorance and how much people have a hate. Before 9-11, I never think about there's hate exist in this country. But no, every day those things happen with the black, you know, community, Asian community, Latino community. I, I witnessed those things and, and it shook me. And I think I, I, I'm very strong and chardi kala, but Valerie always remembering us to be keep in mind. And I'm thinking we can change that. I always took the example. Dr. Martin Luther King have a dream to be the black community have a rights to ride a bus, send their children to a better education and better school. And I was so happy when our president Obama was elected as a president. And I feel that day, the Dr. Martin Luther King dream was succeed and that day. But still, we have a lot of to do in the community to educate other who are ignorant and, and what happened in Wisconsin, what happened in Indiana and what happened to our black brother and sister and Asian people and, and Latino people. I, I go through it because before 9-11, I never involved so much and I don't know very much about that though. What's going on around that I was just focus on my work. But since I lost my brother last 20 year, I'm going to change the world. That's I promised myself. And I try to do that. And last 20 year, I'm going out to educate more people and tell about my turban, tell about my culture, tell about my Sikhism, who we are and what we are the part of this country. We are part of this community. That's the, our constitution, right? This is the beauty of this country. And in fact, uh, 15 years later, uh, myself and Valerie, we're trying to reach the murderer who killed my brother. That's the first time he says sorry to me. And we both cry. One thing really touched my heart when he said that. He said, when I die, I go to the God 
just one thing I want to say to the God. I want to see your brother and hug him and say sorry to him. I did very bad to him, to your family. That's really, you know, break my heart. And and I I forgave, my family forgave this murder. And we, as a Sikh, we don't keep heat in our heart. And that's the Chardi Kala and move forward. And today, I thank you to all of you to come and join with the Sikh community and pray for all the victims on, on tough time. And, and we stand for the humanity and we stand for the love to all. Thank you very much. Ranaji, Pardeep, Komal, thank you. Tonight, we have someone here to respond to you, someone who has listened to your testimonies and is here to tell us that we are indeed not alone. Her name is Erica Moritsugo. She is the deputy assistant to the president and senior API liaison. She is here from the White House on behalf of the White House to speak to you now. Thank you. Thank you. I have to first thank the families, these brave family members, beloved granddaughter, son, and brother for sharing their painful stories with us. We're not entitled to it. It's their stories of grief and loss and heartache that's a generous gift to us, and we're honored by it. Thank you. My heart goes out to the sick community tonight. For too long, the Sikh community has had to carry the unjust burden of being othered in America. For too long, the Sikh community has had to endure violence and pain, including the rise in discrimination and hate after 9-11. Oak Creek, now Indianapolis, and for the hundred years before that. The painful reality is that the Sikh community has experienced too much. With this rise in hate all across our country and so many of our communities, the shadow of feeling like a perpetual foreigner in our own country, it's a burden and a reality many of us face and carry. And yet we persist, and yet we rise. My friends, we, we see you. We love you and we grieve deeply with you and your community. It's our community. Please know that the president the vice president and their entire administration stands with you in this moment. And also in the world that we're building back, anchored on our shared values, our shared humanity, and our shared resilience as Americans. The president performs a solemn duty of ordering the flag lowered at half staff at the White House. It's public building wants her posties across the globe. That was just two weeks after he gave the last such order. My thoughts are with the families who have lost their loved ones and we pray for the wounded for their recovery. We intend to bring healing to this moment, but also beyond to offer safety, recognition, and support for our sick family as a whole. This is a promise from the administration to uplift, recognize, and support the sick community not just in this instance of crisis, but in the months and years to come. We are not leaving your side. I'm deeply humbled for the invitation to be here. In solidarity, always, and with all of the aloha in my heart, thank you. Thank you, Erica. We hear your promise. We receive your promise. We are grateful for your promise. And there are thousands of people here witnessing your promise not to leave our side. So thank you. You heard Ranaji talk about forgiving his brother's murderer. Forgiveness for him is not forgetting. Forgiveness is freedom from hate. And he was inspired by that from our tradition. And so Eric and all of you here, I invite you to listen now to Sik Girtin sick music it's the way that we pray and remember the wisdom that our gurus gave us this kirtan is performed by jasvir kor rababin of raj academy sick singer musician and educator and the shabbat that you're about to hear translates as 
I speak truth. I speak truth. When we are absorbed in pure love, we realize the divine within us and all around us. So now I invite you to take a moment to breathe and let the music fill your heart. My name is Preeti Kaur. I'm going to read a poem. Prayer to the Potter in memory. This poem alludes to the metaphor used in Gurbani that our bodies are kache pande, and Vaheguru, our creator, is a potter who builds us. When I am asked about my life in this country of nine earthen treasures, let me speak to Taram Raj in nine treasures of truth. Let me speak about the light. Let me say I did not accept the sun rising every day, in spite of the bullets shot in the mouth of the country of nine earthen treasures. Let me say, Dan Vaheguru. Let me shadow beneath the blades of grass. Let me look for saints in the stars. Let me say, I looked for the plant workers. There, when the shift ended, the next shift beginning. Let me say, I looked for the honeybee collecting pollen off spring's fiddle neck, the acorn pounded into flour by people who prayed here first. Let me say I looked for the immigrant accepting his first paycheck, the young women who, who just started to know their shape in the world, the grandmother who cooked for everyone. Let me say in this country of nine earthen treasures, 
I fought with the potter who built me the sky, vast with dead. Oh, potter who digs the riverbed of time, potter who pulls out the mud of our work, potter who molds the body into a clay pot, potter who breathes us breath, potter who breaks, potter who bakes the memory of all who pass, potter who casts all that will happen, potter who hardens us into a form not ourselves. Oh, potter, if you must break this clay pot, first give me the blessing of a tongue that can say garden, that can say rice pudding, that can say a joke, can say bird song, can say the eternal name. Potter, if you must break this clay pot, shroud me in a water of undying. Let me face the rising sun with my own rising chest. Let me be cracked, but let me be glazed by hands of a brief grief a field of dandelions, need me on, on your wheel of life. So when asked how I lived in this country of nine earthen treasures, let me answer like a bell, I will, your will, I will. Thank you. Bye, Guji Kalakasa. Bye, Guji Thank you, Preeti. Um, I'm Milk. I am very honored to be here. Um, and thank you for having me in this sacred space and gathering. Um, I want to share a song called Somebody's Beloved. I wrote this song last summer as I was watching uh, a video of Tamika Palmer speak about her daughter, Breonna Taylor. I was thinking about George Floyd, thinking about all the beloved who survive their lost ones. And um, the song poured through me. And um, now as I sing this song, I hold the sick community in my heart. I uh, hold my black and brown siblings in my heart. And I hold um, my East Asian siblings in my heart as well. You are all beloved and thank you. She was somebody's daughter, somebody's friend, someone who built her dreams with every breath whom others could depend. More than a number, more than a story, more than a memory, somebody's friend, somebody's daughter, somebody's beloved. Blood on leaves falling like autumn Her story's been told a thousand times Why doesn't everybody scream For anyone listening Say her name Say her name. He was somebody's father, somebody's son, someone who dreamt of seeing his daughter grow taller and fall in love. More than a number, more than a story, more than a memory, somebody's son, somebody's father. Love, somebody's beloved Blood on leaves falling like autumn And story's been told a thousand times Why doesn't everybody scream For anyone 
listening. Say his name. Say his name. More than just a number. Say their names. More than just a story. Say their names more than a memory. Say their names. Say their names. Say their names. They were somebody's first call, somebody's home. Someone who lived with tears and laughter who wanted to belong more than a number more than a story more than a memory somebody's home somebody's first call somebody's beloved somebody's first call oh somebody's beloved Thank you so much. Thank you, Milk. If you are like me and are feeling this well of emotion in your heart from the music and the song and the poetry from the stories, I invite you to breathe through it with me, knowing that you are brave enough to feel this much grief. You are brave enough to feel this much rage and this much pain because you're not feeling it alone, my love. We're here together inside of this and we're not gonna let this paralyze us. Together we are going to decide how we wanna channel this energy into what we do, what we do with our lives now and next. How do we be brave with our lives now and next? There's one thing I'm going to invite you to do. <laughs> there are three things that you can do for the families in Indianapolis right now. Solidarityvigil.com. We have three calls to action, very simple. One, you can write a message or a prayer to send to the families. The form is right there on the site. Number two, if you have the means, you can donate to the family. <laughs> of the victims in Indianapolis. And number three, if you are someone who uses social media, it's our time to create a story where there was none before. I invite you to post now. Use the hashtag stand with six. You can also use stop Asian hate and end racial violence, but stand with six is how you are making an invisible community visible with your love, with your witness, with your, with your promise to stay with us. Next, we're gonna be hearing from faith leaders, prayers from the most prophetic national faith leaders all across the nation. And to introduce you to them, I invite back with us, Reverend Michael Ray Matthews of Faith in Action. We call on faith leaders who continue this moment of hearing sacred wisdom in verse and song. We hear from faith leaders who stand in the distinctiveness of their traditions and the commonality of our call. I call on this time Imam Khalid Latif, university chaplain at New York University and executive director of the Islamic Center at NYU, Imam Latif. Thank you so much, Pardeep Ji, to Rana Ji, to Komal Ji, to your families, to all those who are feeling real pain, real grief at this time. I want you to know that we're here tonight with you in this moment, and not just on this night, but every tomorrow that we are blessed to be, that we will stand with you we will stand with our sisters and brothers in the sick community. I can't imagine what it feels to lose what it is that you have lost. 
your loved ones, which is the most precious thing that anyone can take from you. And what I would say to you all before I ask you to join me in a short prayer is to not let them take anything else from you, to be strong, to be unapologetic in who it is that you are. I've always admired the values, the ideals, the tenacity and commitment of my sick brothers and sisters to their faith. And I can tell you that from this, we will all come out stronger. If there is anything that I can do, my community can do for any one of you at this time, please don't hesitate in reaching out. I stand with you tonight and I will stand with you for as long as you will let me. And so I ask you all to join me in just a short prayer as we come together, a prayer of healing, a prayer of hope, a prayer of love, and a prayer that our collective hearts being together will allow for it to reach its most highest of pinnacles. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of life and guider of hearts, bless this gathering and all those who are in it. We have come today to stand with our sick brothers and sisters in the aftermaths of the tragic attacks and shootings that took place in Indianapolis. Shower upon them and us your infinite mercy and grant all of us only the best in this world and the best in the next. Guide the footsteps of our brothers and sisters and deepen us in our trust, love, and care for them and each other so that we might come together to help them at this time. Send them only those who will be their helpers and supporters and protect them from any further affliction, anxiety, or anguish. Open their hearts to receive all of the love that we are sending them on this day and envelop them in your divine love always. Grant them peace, relax their fears, and remove from them any impediment that keeps them from doing all that they are able to do. The burdens of life sometimes seem too heavy to bear. The anxiety and anguish that sits inside of us feels bigger at times than the world around us. We seem to be surrounded by a darkness that is impenetrable. Today, we ask you for the sake of our brothers and sisters in the sick community who need us to be better than our best to give us courage. Our struggles are real, but your promise is true. Indeed, with hardship, there always comes ease. Remove from our hearts any fears or inhibitions and replace them with an ever-increasing boldness to live each moment as best as we can. Fill our hearts with a fire of your love and a desire for nothing less than justice for all. Make us the conveyors of truth, the purveyors of truth, the couriers, the carriers, the upholders of truth. Let us not be swayed by false fulfillment, but make us from amongst those who taste true contentment. Help us to see this world always through hearts that are drawn towards real goodness and beauty. To be those who silence fear and abolish anxiety, who overpower indifference and break away from greed, who eliminate arrogance and defeat racism, who are bold enough to ask of you to make us those who only do that which is good. Help us to be above what is simply normal and to never compromise on who it is that we are for those who only accept us when we become that which we are not. Help us to see our race, our heritage, our class, our faith, our gender as a means of strength and never something that we wish wasn't a part of us. Help us to never fear the path of truth for the lack of people walking on it and bless us with leaders to follow who walk firmly upon it. Let our unity be not tied to uniformity of the external, but instead make us sisters and brothers of all colors in our unity based off of a uniformity of our values and hearts. Remove from our hearts any negative thoughts of others and help us to never partake in acts of injustice against people of any background. Love your creation through us. Be gentle to them through us. Increase them in strength through us. Give them courage through us. Help them grow through us. Endow them with confidence through us. Fill them with sincerity through us. Protect them always through us. And through us, bring good and benefit to the rest of this world, most merciful of those who show mercy. Let our anger be only at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we will work for justice, equality, and peace. 
Let our tears shed only for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and conflict, so that we will reach out our hands to comfort them and change their pain into joy. And let our successes be many, as we make a difference in this world by doing the things which others say cannot be done. For our brothers and sisters in the sick community, their loved ones, their family members, and all those who are facing any type of hardship in the world at this time, we simply ask for peace. Protect us always from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. Forgive us for our shortcomings and guide and bless us all. Amen. Nabatif, thank you for that fierce and fervent and faithful prayer. We continue in that vein and call upon dear sister Rabbi Sharon Browse, senior rabbi at ICAR in Los Angeles. Rabbi Browse. Thank you, Imam Khalid Amen. Thank you to my dear sister Valerie and my beloved friend, Reverend Michael Ray. I am honored and humbled to stand with you in this time. One of the turning point moments in the book of Exodus and the great story from enslavement to liberation comes when we're told that the children of Israel were groaning under the bondage and they cried out and their cry rose up to God and God heard them and remembered the covenant and thus began the long walk toward freedom. For thousands of years now, people have been trying to understand what is the nature of a cry that's so powerful that it could awaken the Holy One to partner with the oppressed toward redemption. Some people say it was a cry of despair, but I know that it was a cry of wakefulness. Generation after generation, my Israelite ancestors suffered under the weight of Egyptian oppression. They saw their elders beaten and their babies slaughtered. Their backs broke with hard labor, but they did not cry out. Maybe they believed it wouldn't matter. Maybe they weren't trying to make trouble. Until one day in the language of a, a rabbi writing in Poland in the 1800s, the Mea Shiloach, hit orer behem za'aka, the scream was awakened in them. Their cry was an insistence from the depths of their beings that, that things ought not be, things must not be as they had been. And so our tradition teaches that this is the beginning of redemption, when a person is roused to scream out. The scream is being awakened in us today. That's how I understand what's happening in our country, in our time. We can no longer bear this country's fanatical obsession with guns, nor can we stand the culture of entrenched racism against black people and indigenous people and AAPI people and immigrant communities across this country. With every gunshot, we are roused to scream to the Holy One, to insist that there must be another way. I speak to you today as a Jew, as a person who comes from a community that bears the pain of generational trauma reinforced by anti-Semitic violence over the past several years. That scream is awakened in me. To my six siblings, please know that the Jewish community stands by your side in grief. We see you, we see your pain, and we weep and we scream by your side against this violence. The people in this community are waking up. White supremacy and racist violence, gender-based violence, gun violence, these crises have been with us from before the beginning of this nation. But we are at a turning point now. We're finally seeing that we belong to one another. We're finally realizing that we are all tied up in the bond of life and liberation with one another. So I beg us today not to suppress the scream that's being awakened in us. Let our shared grief fuel our moral imagination. This cry is not a despairing cry. This is a hopeful cry, a wakeful cry, a loving cry. May this cry be the beginning of our collective redemption. Thank you, dear sister, for reminding us of the scream and cry within us. Thank you for reminding us of our belongingness in this moment. We now call upon Varun Soni, Dean of Religious Life at the, at the University of Southern California. 
Welcome. Satsriyakal. 2,500 years ago, a young man set off on a long and difficult spiritual journey to find himself. After many years of austerity and asceticism, he sat down one day under a tree in deep meditation and stood up as the Buddha, or the one who has awakened. Upon his awakening, the Buddha realized that as a human family, we are all intimately and intricately interconnected with each other. And we can only find ourselves by knowing each other. And that is why the first thing the Buddha did was form a spiritual community. Today, we come together as a spiritual community in pain, in grief, and in rage. A spiritual community that is heartbroken and exhausted by the long and painful history of anti-Asian xenophobia and violence in the United States. And a spiritual community that stands in solidarity and support with our sick sisters and brothers who have suffered yet another tragic attack on their beloved community. Since six have arrived in the United States more than 120 years ago, they have continually confronted the darkest and most dangerous elements of American culture and American law, from discrimination to denaturalization, from immigration exclusion to racial profiling, and from hate crimes to targeted killings. And so, tragically, the story is not a new one. But what's new now is that we have each other. We have so many allies and advocates, so many interfaith friends and interreligious partners, and so much care and support, we have a spiritual community, and that means everything. And this spiritual community will bravely take up Valerie Kaur's charge to all of us. We will tell new stories about ourselves and about our world, stories of hope and healing, stories of justice and belonging, stories of redemption, and stories of revolutionary love. And we will remember that we are not isolated beings, but deeply connected in mystery and in miracle to this universe, to this spiritual community, and to each other. It is now my great privilege to offer this ancient prayer from the sacred Hindu text, the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mritor ma mritam gamaya, om shanti, 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 om. May we go from ignorance to truth, May we go from darkness to light. May we go from death to immortality and may all beings find peace. Thank you. Dean Sony, thank you for your affirmation of who we are as a spiritual community. We now call upon Reverend Tracy Blackman, Associate General Minister for the United Church of Christ. Reverend Blackman. Thank you. Good evening. I feel incredibly honored to be welcomed into this sacred space, to hear the stories, to share the pain and to share the tears. And I confess that for me, it feels that we are here more often than we are not. And yes, we are connected. We are one. In recent years, we've experienced a resurgence of racist vitriol globally. And it would be easy to attribute such diatribe to one person or to one group of people. But such assertions are simply untrue and they are unhelpful. There are many ways that many of us have been complicit and I wish I could stand here and say that as a Christian, that we are all where we should be. But sadly, supremacy does not just come in skin tone. It also comes in religion. It also comes in gender violence. And for so many times more than I care to count, in this country, it has been my faith that has caused great harm, great religious intolerance. I stand today because I can't take the good and not be accountable with the bad to say that I pledge to you to continue to fight every day to reclaim the soul of my faith 
so that we show up in ways that hold us accountable and help us to recognize that we don't have a monopoly on what it means to serve the Holy One and that God really is large enough to contain all that has been created and made holy. Structural racism, my friends, is an evil that pervades every institution and every aspect of our society. It has so distorted our biological, sociological, anthropological, and theological perception of the other that most people cannot even imagine the anti-racist world that we work toward. We are connected. And when you hurt, we hurt. When I hurt, you hurt. When death visits the sick community, death visits us all. When death visits the Asian community, death visits us all. When death visits the black and brown communities, death visits us all. And it is as deadly and as virulent as the pandemic that we find ourselves in the midst of. But there is a vaccine and that vaccine only comes in one brand. It is the radical love that my sister Valerie talks about so often. The radical love that I see displayed in the sick community the radical love that makes space and room for the other. My commitment and the commitment of thousands of other people who follow a rabbi named Jesus is that we will be with you, never forgetting that we are one, we are connected, we cannot be separated until everyone is fully seen, until this is a place where everyone feels safe, until your children and my children can play together and not have to change anything about themselves to feel fully loved, until what we wear and how we honor our holy is respected by us all we will be in this together. White supremacy will not have the last word for there is something greater and that is our love. Ashe and amen. Ashe and amen, a vaccine called radical love. Thank you so much, dear sister. Thank you so much for your declaration of multi-faith solidarity. And last among the faith leaders, we bring to you words from Reverend Dr. William Barber II, president and senior lecturer for repairers of the breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. You see. We must stand and we do stand with you against violence and death and killing. We call on America to lift up and not forget these our Sikh brothers and sisters because we cannot be selective. Sometimes in the media, we may focus on one place like Minneapolis, but it's not just there or Columbus, Ohio, it's not just there, or Black people, it's not just there. We have to have the capacity to see it all, to mourn it all, to cry over it all, to stand against it all, to fight against it all. Because in a true sense, we are all in this together. We're all made in the image of God. We all are brothers and sisters. And we all have life that 
no human being has a right to take because they did not give it and they cannot return it. So we weep with you, we pray with you, we mourn with you, and we stand with you in the eternal vigilance, nonviolent loving vigilance against violence and death. America, you're going to have to, and you're gonna to have to do it soon. Decide that in America, violence and death is no longer an option. We must do it soon. Lest as Fannie Lou Hamer said, I question who we are as a people. For those of us who know who we are and more importantly, whose we are, let us never stop mourning with one another, building movements with one another and believing forever in the possibility of transformation and know that violence will not have the last word as long as we are living, breathing and clothed in our right mind and filled with God's heart of love, compassion, mercy, and grace and truth. Love you more than you know. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Barber. Thank you to all of the faith leaders here tonight for your fierce witness and your moral clarity. We are about to head into our third and final part of our program. We have heard from Sikh community voices. We have heard from faith leaders and we're about to hear from our nation's movement leaders. But before we do, we just wanna pause for a moment and take in everything that we have heard so far with some music and poetry. I'm about to introduce Mokum Singh to give us a tabla solo. He's a sick youth musician. And then after that, we'll hear from Japanese American poet, Bryn Saito. Mokum, I invite you to begin with, you know, what does it feel like for you as a young Sikh American to hear all of the faith leaders gone before us speak to you, speak to us, telling us that they love us, that we are connected, that they will not leave our side. Do you feel those prayers in your heart, brother? Um, thank you so much, Valerie Gore, Valerie Gore Benji, for inviting me to be a part of this. And to answer your question, absolutely, it was one of the most heartwarming things I've ever felt, I would say, to hear five faith leaders of different faiths, of different communities, come together and, and talk to me, talk to me directly and talk to my community directly and, and tell them that they stand with me. And that made me feel so empowered. And, you know, as someone who literally goes to school an hour away from where this shooting happened, I go to Indiana University, IU, um, you know, this, this, this event, this, this shooting hit me pretty hard. And, um, and just the words that I just heard were so, so powerful and uplifting, uplifting for me. And I appreciate it so much. I also just want to say that um, events like these, people like Valerie Corpenji, who who put these events together to bring solidarity, you know, like in these in these terrible shootings that occur, it's so easy to get bogged down and think about all the bad things, think about all the bad in the world. But events like these, people who are doers and not just sayers and posters, people who are really doers, um, bring us so much unity. And and the title of this event, which is solidarity, I think it's perfect because they bring us so much solidarity, and. I think it's so important with everything in this world trying to divide us from politics to, to media to whatever, everything's trying to divide us. But, of, but events like these go so far to unifying us, to bringing us together. And that's what I think is what we need to solve the issues that plague our society, that caused these terrible shootings that occurred just briefly a week ago. And so without further ado, I'm gonna play a uh, tabla solo. Tabla is an Indian classical percussion instrument that I've been playing since I was about five years old. And I'm going to be playing a, a brief tabla solo that has a couple of barans, a gut, and a chakradar. And um, uh, my tabla teacher is Swapan Chaudhuriji, and I also want to take a moment to thank him because without him, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be anything. So thank you so much to Swapan Chaudhuriji. 
And uh, my tabla solo is in Tintal, which is 16 beats, which is the mother of all tals. And without further ado, I'll get started. Chakradar. And a chakradar has three, three components, three phrases that are played one after the other, and at the end, they end on the same beat. And so, I'll say this chakradar now. last composition and it goes like this Thank you so much, Malcolm. That was, I feel just so grounded and alive by your offering and by your words. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to uh, be in this, this very sacred space with, with all of you. I um, just want to share briefly that after the news of you know the mass shooting in Atlanta and the tragedy and the and the um, ongoing targeting of my own elders, I called on Valerie and I called on her community. And after Oak Creek and after 9/11, she called on us. And decades before our friendship even began, um, Valerie's grandfather stood alongside my elders and kept watch over their farms in the Central Valley of California when they were forced into desert prisons during the Japanese American incarceration of World War II. So solidarity is truly ancestral. And tonight we, we hold space for the Sikh community and hopefully we're planting the seeds to nourish all the labor to come. So this is a short poem called Ever Rise. Say to meadow light and broken morning, say wound and community. Say tonight no poetry will serve, say no truth but poetry. Say one of us rising into grief's burning, say one of us wrapped in mother love and mourning. Say I cannot summon the we until I find you. 
Say, your wailing is a sword and I hear you. Say, my vision is dark, but I see you. Say, the heart is a muscle and I feel you. Say, my children and your children and their children. Say, what are we dreaming? Say, tonight, no more silence. Say, ancestral solidarity. Say, temple, prayer hall, sea glass, stone. Say, I am lost in the desert. Your voice calls me home. Thank you. Thank you, Bryn. I invite each of you to think of an ancestor who makes you brave and invite them into this sacred virtual space tonight in ancestral solidarity that we get to continue on. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Bryn. In our final part of our evening, we will be hearing from movement leaders from across the country. For this part, we will be hearing from Deepa Iyer, seasoned activists on the front lines for the last 20 years now at the Building Movement Project to introduce these leaders to you. Deepa. Thank you so much, Valerie, for creating space for all of us and holding space for all of us this evening. And welcome to everyone who is watching around the country. I have learned so much about the power of solidarity from Sikh communities after 9-11, after Oak Creek, and now after Indianapolis. And perhaps like me, after you've been listening to these artists and poets, faith leaders, and people like Komal, Mr. Sodhi, and Pardeep, you're wondering, what is my role? How do I dismantle white supremacy and generations of oppression? How do we deal with racial trauma that is passed on from generation to generation? How do we recommit to each other in the spirit of co-liberation? How do we thrive and not just survive? That is what we are going to be talking about in this next segment. You will be hearing from movement leaders who are on the front lines of building power in indigenous, Latinx, black, Muslim communities. They're here to offer their support and solidarity as they have always been ready to do. So without any further ado, I wanna go ahead and get us started. First, we're going to hear from Camila Rashad from the Muslim Wellness Foundation. Camila, tell us, when racial trauma shows up in our communities, how can solidarity be a bomb and a practice? Assalamu alaikum, good evening. Uh, peace to everyone who is watching, who have joined. Um, I am incredibly honored to be a part of this space as echoed by everyone else. Um, it is it is really tremendous um, to hear and to be able to, to sit with both the pain, but also the incredible joy that I have felt, um, the coming together of those who are committed to one another, committed to our humanity, committed to seeing each other smile again. Um, and so we can also bear witness to that. First, I would like to express my deepest condolences to those who have lost loved ones, family members um, in the Sikh community of Indiana, um, you are in mourning of something that's almost unspeakable. Your grief is unimaginable. Your grief is palpable. And you do not, and you must not, bear the weight of this alone. Sort of the insidious aspect of white supremacy and racial violence is the trauma that it caused within us, both directly and indirectly. This violence would have us believe that no one cares, that our lived experiences are invisible, are inconsequential, are insignificant, yet we know better. And so when we face this trauma, when we encounter this kind of violence, we know that when we show up for one another, we tell a different story. It tells a story that we are all connected and not simply as victims of white supremacy, but as those who would together dream of a different way of being, of relating, of building, of transforming the world. We bear witness to each other's suffering and anguish and in that bearing witness is a healing. And we do this wholeheartedly 
We do this in moments of tragedy. And we also are prepared to do and bear witness as a practice so that we can lift up our collective moments and hours and days and months and years of happiness and delight as well. World-renowned African-American author, James Baldwin said, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. And I would add, and then you connect with other marginalized people who are actually of the global majority, that you rejoice with one another, that you become curious about one another's struggle and joy, and you see and you love those who face the trauma of white supremacy and racial violence. And in that seeing and in that connection, we begin to repair all of the damage that is constantly being done. So Baldwin also said, love takes off the mask we fear we cannot live without, and no, we cannot live within. So given the enormity of the systems that we face, systems designed to crush us, we must affirm one another's humanity, we must see one another and love one another fiercely. And in this bearing witness and in this love and in this connection, I am reminded of a dear friend of mine, Simi, who will text me when there are instances of murder and violence in the black community. And I think of her and I reach out to her when there are also moments of violence against her community, against other sick Americans. And so we are bonded to one another, not just by the evil and the violence that we face, but by the love that we begin to cultivate for one another. So my prayer is that in this time of uncertainty and violence and immense reckoning, that when we come together and we are bonded, that is also a balm. So I pray that the creator always guides our steps towards one another, towards our faith, towards courage, and that we are forever blessed with the strength with each other to stand against injustice. That the creator grants us the patience to persevere in the way of truth, even when we feel overwhelmed by the arrogance of inequity. That our hearts and minds remain hopeful that our pain is eased by the embrace that we feel around the world, and that those in our lives that nourish us with an abundance of love, compassion, empathy, and honesty are also able to be a part of that embrace, that unbreakable circle, and that we are able to move together so that we are always thinking of one another, both in times of challenge but also in those times when we want to rejoice with one another. Um, so again, my condolences to the sick American community of Indianapolis and all of those who are impacted by the fear and the sense of isolation and just the sorrow that we stand with you, that I, as an African-American Muslim woman, a descendant of enslaved Africans in both the US and the Caribbean, that my roots are here and that I am rooted and the commitment of standing with my sick American family and that this love and this embrace is offered to you freely and sincerely and wholeheartedly. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Kamila. And knowing you, I know that that commitment is real and present every single day. So now I want to bring in Grace Martinez Rosas, who is the executive director of United We Dream. Grace, you have been building power and organizing undocumented youth, and you know what the power of solidarity is. So tell us, why is solidarity our shared superpower, especially in this moment when we are fighting so many levels of oppression? Thank you, Deepa, and hello to everyone tonight. Um, it is my honor to join you all tonight. I bring you greetings from the immigrant young people of United We Dream. Uh, my name is Grace Martinez Rosas. I use she, her, ella pronouns. My friends and my loved ones call me G. Um, and I uh, join myself tonight both to the, to the heartache and the prayer and the music and the song that we've heard tonight. And you know, when I, when I think about this question, I think about the poem in La Quesh by Luis Valdez that says, Tu eres mi otro yo, si te hago daño a, a ti, me, dago, me hago daño a mí mismo. Si te, si te amo y te respeto, me amo y me respeto a yo. You are my other me. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. 
If I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. And, um, you know, I, I grew up uh, the daughter of Southern Baptist preachers in Texas. And the biggest thing that, they, I, that comes out of that part of my childhood is this, is the knowing that joy comes in the morning. And that in this, in this moment, though, it, might, it may feel frail, and we carry the words and the names of um, Micaiah, of the people um, that were, that, whose names have been spoken into this place, of Adam, Toledo, and, and Chicago, um, of the history that the Pseudo for Solidarity folks have like, been able to, to bring into this place. I join myself to the freedom fighters like Judith Brown, Dianis, like Deepa Iyer, like Valley Krayur, like Mike Ishii, and many others on this call to say that the superpower is the realization that though sometimes it is hard and difficult in this moment, joy, the collective joy comes in the morning, sisters and brothers. And I know that in moments like this, um, sometimes it feels like we're alone and that like things may not get, are hard to see into the night, but um, I, wanna, I wanna remind us of who we were called to be. We are those of the people that have poured into us, our mothers, our loved ones. Um, we are the, those of the mentors that have poured joy and knowledge and solidarity into this moment. And so we are the ones um, in this moment to be able to embrace each other, to know that we are not alone and, and to remember that we have already won. Just the fact that we're here together at 9.51 p.m. on a Thursday night, wherever you're standing, and we are saying without any hesitation that we are gonna to join together and in, in loss and in pain and in joy and in anger, we stand together. And so I, I say to you that um, we have come too far. We will not turn around we will flood the streets with justice because we are freedom bound. And those are the words of the powerful black poet, June Jordan. She follows us today and she tells us that joy comes in the morning, sisters and brothers. And I'm really excited of being here together with all of you and joining myself um, in the fight for freedom with you. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for bringing James Baldwin and June Jordan into this space. We are so grateful. Um, now I want to actually invite into the space Mike Ishii from Suru for Solidarity. Um, as we all know, Asian American communities um, through our time here in the United States have faced tremendous exclusion, incarceration, deportation, and racism. And Suru for Solidarity works with Japanese Americans to bring the, this idea that Grace had just talked about, about bearing witness and solidarity to all communities. So Mike, welcome and tell us why Japanese Americans are standing in solidarity with Sikh communities and stopping anti-Asian hate. Thank you, Deepa. And uh, I have to send a big hug to um, all my brothers and sisters out there. Um, Grace, thank you. <laughs> I love you. Um, first, I want to offer my condolences. Um, the continued violence toward people of the global majority in this country is, is disheartening. And in this moment, um, I know a lot of people are, are holding space for grief and brokenheartedness and a lot of deep pain. And um, I, I hold your pain. Um, as a Japanese American fourth generation Yonsei, I am the son of uh, a mother who was incarcerated by the United States government in a concentration camp when she was a child. Um, and my community was silenced. The impact of the violence that targeted us, targeted us was surveillance, forced removal, mass incarceration, murder, deportation, and a deep silencing. And they also uh, succeeded in splitting our community in half and having us fight each other. That exists today. And we work very hard to heal those schisms, um, but the work continues. And so sort of listening to the powerful voices this evening, I just want to say that um, I, I hold your searing grief and outrage. And I think it's through speaking our truth um, and 
controlling the narrative of our history and our story that we actually find healing and liberation. I just want to lift up that it was a month ago also that the, the massacre took place in Atlanta. And, you know, this is an outgrowth. It's a, it's a logical conclusion. Uh, res, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a logical conclusion and consequence to imperialism and colonialism of our countries of origin. Um, in this country. People come to this country as immigrants. My grandfather was an undocumented immigrant who came to this country. Um, and we come here seeking better lives, but also um, we, we come here because of the issues of racism and white supremacy around the world that have actually destabilized our, our, our countries of origin. Um, and those women that were murdered those dear beloved sisters that were murdered in Atlanta, like our brothers and sisters who were murdered this past week, uh, our sick brothers and sisters um, didn't deserve that. And so we're, we're demanding, we're demanding better from this country. Um, my own family was massacred and executed during World War II in upstate New York by a white gunman who came into their house on Christmas Eve, 1943, and he shot them uh, point blank with a gun and he, he killed them. And so I'm listening and I'm holding space for you and I'm remembering my own family history. And unfortunately, it's not an anomaly for us. Um, and in the aftermath of World War II, after my community finally was released from mass incarceration, one of the things that happened was that we we um, we went silent, and the violence that was targeted on, upon us actually caused us to seek safety, um, seek safety in proximity to whiteness, and we're still unraveling that legacy of the model minority myth. And I just want to say that one of the things that I'm deeply proud of is that in the, at 9/11 our community found its voice and its authentic narrative struggle. And we stood with the Sikh and the Muslim communities and we were terrified to do it and we did it anyway. And we will continue to stand with you now. We, stand, we, we went to Texas to the detention sites to stand at the barbed wire and demand they release children being taken away from their parents. We'll do the same thing over and over again because what we know now finally is that our healing is not related to proximity to whiteness. It's not, it will never happen. It's when we stand together and we stand together at the front line that actually that's when the healing of my community began to take place. And so we will be with you. We will be with you in the darkest hour and we will continue to be with you. And so will you be with us, we know. Um, I love you and I, my, my heart's breaking for you right now. But know that um, also the sun will rise tomorrow and we will be there together. So I send my love to you all. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for sharing your personal pain. Thank you for reminding us that solidarity requires us to overcome our fears and to show up again and again and again. And that's what Sulu for Solidarity does. Thank you. Um, now I want to bring in uh, my sister, my mentor, Judith Brown Dianis from the Advancement Project. Judith, as you know, we marked the verdict this week in Minneapolis with relief, but we also knew that the fight for systemic racism to end anti-Black racism is far from over. Why must we have a practice of collaboration in this moment? Well, thank you, Deepa, um, for inviting me this evening. Um, it is an honor to be here with you all, um, and it has been a, just an incredible evening. Um, it has filled my spirit and my soul, and it was something that I needed in this moment. And my love and prayers are with the families who lost loved ones in Indianapolis and the Sikh community. It was horrific. No one should send their loved ones off to work and worry whether they will return at the end of the day. It's simple, we must all feel safe. We must all feel that this country 
is our country, that we built it and that we are building it and that it is better off because of all of us. You know, Deepa, I um, just days ago, uh, feels like a lifetime ago, sat in front of a television awaiting the verdict in the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. I had watched the video of the murder several times. I sat through days of testimony watching on TV. My heart ached for the witnesses, especially the teenager who filmed it and the nine-year-old who witnessed it. The trauma that they are experiencing, that we all experience, are experiencing from witnessing the death of another black man at the hands of the police and at the hands of the state is very heavy. I must say I was relieved at the guilty verdict. The feeling that Derek Chauvin could be held accountable was important in the moment, yet I knew that it wasn't enough, that it wasn't the end. I knew that it was a whole system that allowed this to happen and that it had not been fixed by this one verdict. In fact, within moments we, of the reading of the verdict, we heard about a 16 year old black girl, Micaiah Bryant, who was killed by the police in Columbus. I was jarred by the photo of her shoes. She had on Crocs, the same shoes that my teenage daughter wears. And it sat with me that that was somebody's baby, someone's daughter. And then today, Dante Wright was laid to rest after being killed by a cop just miles from where George Floyd was murdered. It's all heavy. It is all hard. We are all carrying the weight of hate, white supremacy, and institutions that operate on these principles. There have been days when I have felt like just staying in bed or trying to ignore it, but I can't. My problem is that I have the nerve to hope for something better. I have the nerve to want to spend my life working for something better. I have the nerve to believe that people who came here in shackles, who were the property of white people, had to march and protest for basic civil and human rights, will one day be free. I know that all of us have struggled under the burdens of oppression and hate. I know that we continue to do the work of those who love justice and freedom. I know this work is bigger than my people, that I have a larger community that wants what my people want, which is safety and true freedom. Freedom from hate, freedom to love, freedom to live and to thrive. It is in these moments like this that we must lean on each other, on this larger community, that we must work for the freedom of all of us. We cannot win without each other. As you have stood with us, know that we stand with you. Your freedom is my freedom. When your community hurts, I hurt. Through our mutual love of freedom, justice, and democracy, we will drive out hate. We will end racism. We will build a future where we will lay down our pain and thrive. Thank you for having me this evening. And please know that, um, that so many of us stand with you and our hearts are with you in these hard moments. Thank you, Judith. I think I can speak for everyone watching that we felt that we know you stand with us and we are so grateful and we are, we are following the leadership of Black communities to liberation and justice, so thank you. Um, we have a couple of more speakers who are going to share with us their visions of solidarity. And now um, I'm going to invite Don Ragona from the Native American Rights Fund to share 
why Native communities stand in solidarity and what we can learn from Indigenous practices of solidarity and connection. Go ahead, Don. Great. Thank you, Deepa. I, I, I truly appreciate the um, what's what's being said this evening and and what's uh, and what's been shared. Um, my name is Don Ragona. I'm the I'm a citizen of the Matinecock Indian Tribe of New York. Um, I also have a lot of family and relatives on the Pine Ridge and Rosebud reservations in South Dakota. I'm the director of development and house counsel for the Native American Rights Fund. And uh, the Native American Rights Fund, or NARF, is a, it's a legal organization that's been fighting for Native rights for over 51 years. You know, first, I'd like to say on behalf of the Native American Rights Fund, our executive director, John Echohawk, our staff, and our board of directors, uh, I'd like to offer our deepest and sincerest condolences to the families of the victims of this horrendous act of violence and to the sick community of Indianapolis. We offer our prayers and our condolences to you all and for your loved ones' journeys. I also want to thank the Revolutionary Love Project, Faith in Action, the Sick Coalition, and you, Deepa, uh, for the invitation to pray and to speak with you tonight. I'm truly humbled and, and, and honored to be here. You know, growing up, I, I was blessed with, with, a, with an amazingly strong traditional family on, on both sides. Um, I, I was able to grow up around our, our traditional leaders with our languages, um, and also among and around movement leaders like Russell Means and Dennis Banks and Vernon Bellacourt, so many others. Um, and they taught me to be proud of who I am. They taught me to, to, to not reject uh, what we are, uh, not to walk in shame of who we are. And that every time we spoke our language and every time uh, we dressed the way we dress traditionally and wear our hair long and, and so on, um, that it was an act of resistance, but also an act of pride in honoring those ancestors that came before us. For over 500 years, the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island have endured terrorism and genocide and were, and were subjected to the racist genocidal government policies of extermination, relocation, and forced assimilation. Yet we're still here. Our ancestors refused to submit and disappear. Rather, and often with dire consequences to themselves and to their families and their tribal nations, they hung fast to our languages, our spiritualities, and our cultures. It's those things, the things that make us who we are, that give us strength. The very things they wanted to eradicate is what helped us to persevere and to survive. It's a beautiful way of life that was given to us by the Creator, and no other human being has the right to take that away. And that's true of all cultures and all religions. We have been taught that every living thing on the earth has a purpose and a place. Living this way creates harmony and balance for the earth and everything upon it. It was there in our sacred duty to protect that way of life and who we are, but we cannot do that alone. No community can face a tidal wave of hate alone. If we want to survive and to live the ways the creator gave us all, then we must join together and stand up against the hatred and violence that is being perpetrated against our communities. And that's why the native peoples of Turtle Island will continue to stand in solidarity with the Sikh community, black communities, brown communities, and Asian communities to oppose and condemn any and all acts of terrorism and violence that are directed towards our communities and towards our loved ones. Together, we will draw the line in the sand and say no more. It's our collective right to live in peace and be respected for who we are as human beings. And only by standing strong together in solidarity without fear can we make that happen. And I can tell you that we will be there for, for your communities as I know you'll be there for ours. I wanna thank you for allowing me to share tonight and allowing me to be here and to pray with you. And, and all the love that I can, I can draw up from my inner being goes out to, to you and to your communities and, and to the loved ones, families that you lost. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don, for reminding us of 
the power of our ancestors and reminding us that cultural practices and languages preservation are all acts of resistance. Thank you. Next, um, we're going to actually hear a pre-recorded message from Ai-jen Pu of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. My name is Ai Jen Pu, and I'm the director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and of Caring Across Generations. And on behalf of our community of caregivers, we wanted to extend our love, our solidarity, and our care to the sick community in our country. This last week has been devastating and painful, and we know that it is only the for most recent in a long history of racial violence targeting the Sikh community. And we want you to know that we will not forget. We will not forget that history. We will not forget the beautiful lives we lost in Indianapolis last week, and that we will be with you, that you are a part of us and we are a part of you, and that we will stand with you together for as long as it takes, today, tomorrow, for as long as it takes until we can have true justice and healing in this country. We're thinking of you and honored to be a part of the Solidarity Vigil tonight. Thank you so much to Aijin, to Camila, Greisa, Mike, Judith, Don, for your declarations of solidarity, your commitments to collaboration. And now I would like to invite Sajit Kaur from the Sikh Coalition into our space. The Sikh Coalition has been on the front lines of what has been happening in Indianapolis, and they have been handling so many requests of support, responding to media, um, and really connecting with all of our communities. Sajit, as you heard all of these commitments to collaboration, what is coming up for you? And what does the Sikh community need us to do right now? Thank you, Deepa. Um, thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Revolutionary Love, uh, Faith in Action for bringing us all together in this space tonight. Um, you know, Deepa, uh, a colleague of mine actually asked me the question this late this afternoon of like what I'm feeling and, and while I am sad, um, I'm also really angry and frustrated and a space like this, um, helps ease some of that. Um, and so I, I do appreciate this space and um, actually being able to step away from rapid response right now and to reflect, um, I think is good for all of us. Um, you know, on Friday morning, when I first got the call that six were most likely among those killed, um, my heart sunk in a way that it sunk on Sunday, August 5th, 2012 for Oak Creek. I dread these calls. Um, my phone sometimes ringing makes me anxious um, because the reality is I, those on my team, those on the front line, so many people that are on this call uh, today get those types of phone calls far too often and more often than is even reported in the news. And, and I think we have to sit with that. Um, Malika Gore, a friend and the executive director of the Sick Family Center recently said in a statement, Anyone who does not enjoy the privilege of whiteness in this country would instantaneously think racism must be investigated as a motive. And so I just wanna sit with that for a second because as we continue to call for a thorough investigation, including the potential of bias as a motive, it's important to understand that that's the impact that any moment like this actually has on us. Um, this shooter had a previous propensity to violence. Um, last year, they had found white supremacist websites on his computer. And he obviously had a vast understanding of the demographics of this FedEx facility um, and its employees. And so as we're putting all of these pieces together, um, yes, it points us in that direction. Um, and while it's being investigated, I think it's more important to sit with like what the impact it has on us, regardless of what motive is found. There was a hate 
that ran so deep in a deeply flawed system that led to a young man to take the lives of eight beautiful humans. Amarjeet Jahal, Jaswinder Gore, Amarjeet Seko, Jaswinder Singh, Carly Smith, Matthew, Alexandra, Samara Blackwell, and John Weiser. And we can't forget those names. We can't forget those individuals because they are the backbone of America, all of them. And we also can't forget those who survived but are gonna live with this nightmare continuously. And Deepa, to get to your question about what we can all do, look, I'm gonna say this and I say this always, this the community is strong and resilient. And though we face this trauma and we face countless traumas, um, this the community will continue to rise, serve and protect others. No one can break that spirit of fearlessness and internal optimism. That being said, we collectively have to do more. Uh, marginalized communities, minority communities, black and brown communities should not have to continuously fight for their existence or prove their worth. Some of those killed have witnessed many tragedies in their lifetime and continue to watch them unfold across America and across the world. And so if we wanna honor them, if we wanna remember them, let's start by understanding their stories and fight for a tomorrow that isn't plagued with that same epidemic of hate and violence. And so my call to action is first, please directly support the families in Indianapolis. Um, the attention is gonna be gone in a couple of days. People are gonna move on, but they're gonna to have to go back to that FedEx facility. Um, somebody in their family is going back to that FedEx facility. Um, they are gonna to continue to live with that fear. So please, more important than anything else, support them and support those who have been impacted with this type of violence. But my second call to action is find your place in the movement, find your place, find your role and just build off of that. It doesn't have to be everything. We all can't do everything. And I keep reminding myself of that. So if you're an educator, find ways to integrate diverse and unique perspectives of different communities. If you're in corporate America, what policies are you putting together to ensure that people aren't abused? Um, if you work in policy, what role are you playing in all of this and in designing policies that um, empower people instead of holding them back? Um, whatever it is, say enough is enough and find your role. Thank you, Sajid. Thank you for um, holding the rapid response down. Thank you for giving us those calls to action and um, for being here in this space. So as we kind of wrap up this section, I just wanted to summarize and synthesize some of the really powerful phrases that stood out to me. And perhaps you are also holding some of these phrases and taking them with you. But while we have come together at a moment of deep pain and trauma, we've been reminded to bear witness. We've been reminded to show up again and again for each other. We've been reminded to fight the systems of white supremacy and not fight each other. We've been reminded that while there is shared pain, there is also shared struggle. We've been reminded that even though everything is heavy and everything is hard, that we can look to the strength and resilience and histories of our ancestors. We've been reminded that we must build the capacity and the nerve to fight for justice and freedom, and that always we must support survivors and solutions that center survivors and find a role to play depending on our skills and our networks in movements, in organizations, and in our local communities. So with that, thank you to Camila, Grace, Mike, Judith, Dawn, Sajith, Aijin, and I'm going to turn it back over to Valerie. Thank you so much, Deepa. Thank you to all of you. In a few moments, we're going to close our program with music and song. We'll have musical artists, musical legends, Ari Afsar, Ani DeFranco, Kat Nada Haiku. We'll be sending us off in that spirit of Jardavikala and solidarity. But before we get there, here's what I want you to know. Gomo, who lost her grandmother in the shooting in Indianapolis, family members from the Sikh community in Indianapolis have been watching all night long, sending me messages, weeping with us, breathing with us, taking in all of your prayers, all of your declarations of solidarity and support. And it's a bomb to our hearts. It returns us to Jardikla. 
And so to the, all the sick community in Indianapolis and across the country who are watching tonight, there's one more thing I want you to know. You've been hearing all night voices across the United States. There are voices across the world standing in solidarity with you tonight. I'm about to play a message that was sent to us by the world chairman of the Human Rights Commission, Dr. Mohammed Khan. We'll take a moment to hear him. And as you do, just take in the world's prayers, the world's witness with you. And I'll come back for a closing reflection. And then we end with song. Dr. Khan. We are showing our solidarity, love with the families of those sick who has been lost their life in the violence at the United States of America. International Human Rights Commission is strongly condemning this brutality against the innocent peoples and the families, those who lost their loved ones. Let us to end this violence and hatred against the Sikh community and the Asian community in the United States of America. Emphasizing to the President Joe Biden and the all other governmental institution to take action against those who are perpetrating the violence against the innocent peoples. In this way, Vigil, I stand with the people. Thank you. Before we close, I just invite you to take another breath with me. And as you do, notice what you are feeling in your body. Let it come. Mm, good, and let it go. And if you've been with us all night, notice how it might be a little different from what you felt at the beginning of the night. I know that I can breathe deeper. I know that I can find longevity in this long labor for justice. Because when we breathe together, we last. Before we leave tonight, I want to remind you of the things that you can do immediately. You heard it from our sister, Satyajit Kaur, to show up and support the families on the ground in Indianapolis. And remember, there are three things that you can do right now. You go to solidarityvigil.org, and number one, you can write a prayer or a message of solidarity to the families. We at the Revolutionary Love Project, we will bind up your prayers into books and hand deliver them to the families in Indianapolis. You could also donate to the families to support all of the costs, all, all of the hardship that's going to be following for this working class community. And you can post. <laughs> now I'm serious about this. We're creating tonight a story where there was none before. Anything that you wish to say tonight, to witness tonight, anything you wanna share with the world, your friends, your community tonight, go online, go to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, post from your heart. If you need ideas, solidarityvigil.com, they'll show you some sample posts that you can use. Just use the hashtag stand with six, stand with six. And if you want, you can add stop Asian violence or end racial hate, but stand with six. That is what you have done tonight. For the last few years, I have held a question in my heart. The future is dark, but what if this darkness in our nation is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? My loves, it is both. It is both. There are days that are so dark that I can taste the ash in my mouth. Friday night was one of those nights. Hearing about the details of the shooting I remember the last time you felt that ash in your mouth, the darkness of the tomb. But when we come together to breathe like this, to grieve like this, then these are the moments when I see the darkness of the womb. And these moments, I see glimpses of the nation that is longing to be born. 
an America that is truly multiracial, multi-faith, multi-gendered, multicultural, where we see one another as part of each other, where all of us belong. Didn't you feel that tonight? I felt it tonight. With every single testimony, every single prayer, every single song, every single poem, every single declaration of support, this is what we could be. This is what we could be where we are, each of you, are midwives to a nation that is in transition. And if you take what you can tonight into your heart and show up where you are, every school, every workplace, every industry, every home, to build beloved community with this in your heart, with the spirit of Chardikala, ever rising joy, every rising spirits, even in darkness, then we begin to birth what has not yet been. An America where we see no stranger. An America where I can look at you and say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. An America where you see my child as your child, where you see Como's grandmother as your grandmother, where we see one another as worth grieving and worth fighting for. Maybe then, maybe then we can birth a nation where our children can be freer than we are. My commitment to you is to stay in that labor, to breathe with you tonight, and to push with you tomorrow. Will you make that commitment with me? Stay in it, my love. In the grief, in the rage, breathe through it in community, in solidarity. Let that joy, that ever-rising spirit take you. That's how we find longevity. That's how we last. And even if we do not live to see the nation that we are trying to birth, this is what I promise you. When we show up to the labor for a more just and beautiful world with love, that is the meaning of life. It is enough. You are enough. So with hands clasped, I say to you, Vahikuruji ka khalsa, Vahikuruji ki fateh. In the name of beloved community, we find oneness. I leave you now with song from Cat Not a Haiku, Ani DeFranco, who will be singing Revolutionary Love, and Ari Afsar, who will be singing a song called We Won't Sleep. Dance with us into the night. Hello everyone, my name is Kat, not a haiku, and I stand alongside you today in grief, in solidarity, and in love. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s observation that the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice is on my mind. And in this present moment, so is the pain of invisibility as it relates to the sick community and the pain you all are holding. I stand alongside you. I hold pain alongside you, your pain and the pain of those who are unable to be present. And I offer love. I love you. And I offer a poem as well. I am here with Ani DeFranco in the spirit of revolutionary love. An unwell man extinguishes the life of a sick man under the watchful gaze of the sun. Both men's lives come undone. Futility, division, the only battles won. If everything is gestation, then birthing, contractions before new life. I lay down my weapons, I 
dress the wound, my mother stands at my side. You are brave, she whispers, warrior's blood, your sword and shield made of light. Her mother behind her and her mother behind her. She is infinite, dark as night. We see darkness with new eyes, the gift of crowning, no illusion of security. Revolutionary love turns stranger to sister. You are no stranger to me. An unwell man extinguishes the life of a sick man. And both men are me. If the aroma of love is sweet labor, I roll up my sleeves, I breathe. If the aroma of love is sweet labor, I roll up my sleeves, I breathe.
revolutionary love, the revolutionary love. What an honor it is to be here with each and every one of you tonight. Tonight, hopefully, together we grieved, we mourned, we healed, and we dreamed for a more equitable future. It is an honor to be among activists and advocates and dreamers and survivors and believers and artists who are fighting for this better future. My name is Ari Afsar. I'm a proud Bangladeshi American, a singer, songwriter, and storyteller. I believe we're all here to dream for this better future and to fight to make it happen. The song I'm going to be singing is called We Won't Sleep. It is from the musical Jeanette, which I'm the composer of. The first woman elected into U.S. federal office four years before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave white women the right to vote. This song is the end of Act Two in celebration and enthusiasm and excitement of something that has never been done before. This is We Won't Sleep. We've been trying, woman, a child. Could make it easy, could live in denial We saw the world end, but it keeps spinning Whether we're losing, whether we're winning Then they start to fade while I wide awake And feel alive Been staying up late, cause we know the stakes I'm We won't sleep, ah, uh, they'll try to get us, but we gon' reach, ah, uh, reach out for love. We won't sleep, no, not till it's over, even with the blurry eyes, baby, we won't compromise. I dreamed in color when I was younger, painted a picture, one hand in the other. Shadows outside my window, but I won't close them. No, not when we know that they start to fade. Whoa, 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 feel it like. Been staying up late, cause we know the stakes of love the light. We won't sleep. Even with the blurry eyes, baby, we won't compromise. 